What's in a name? The Aristocrat Behind Shakespeare's Claim to Fame by Frank Landsman, M.A. The legendary man from Stratford's social and educational background has always seemed at odds with the vast cosmopolitan knowledge, wisdom and elegant wit displayed in Shakespearean plays and poetry. Decoding Sonnet 76 may solve the centuries-old mystery that has been puzzling writers, academics and the general reader. At first glance, celebrated literati such as the American novelists Henry James and Mark Twain, the pioneer of psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud and the tragic comic movie star and director Sir Charles Chaplin seem to have little or nothing in common except perhaps for their admirable powers of imagination and daring experimentalism. Yet they all agreed that there was something decidedly fishy about a grain merchant from the provincial backwater of Stratford-upon-Avon named Shakespeare, having earned such praise as the, the greatest literary genius that ever lived. After all, his parents and offspring were illiterate, and he himself left no books or correspondence whatsoever. He neither possessed any inside knowledge of courtly life, etiquette and wit, nor mastered the eight languages displayed in the Shakespearean comedies, tragedies and poetry celebrated the world over. Even the well-known Drushout portrait of the Stratford man has raised countless eyebrows for several reasons. It closely resembles a famous painting of Queen Elizabeth I, it seems to be wearing a mask, and the facial expression is that of a drooling dullard instead of a bright and indefatigably innovative man of letters, as I observed myself as an eight-year-old Amsterdam schoolboy visiting Stratford half a century ago. Freud suggested that the man from Stratford has nothing at all to justify his claim, whereas Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, has almost everything. The English schoolmaster J. Thomas Looney published an elaborate study in 1920 to prove that this aristocrat must indeed have been the man behind the Swan of Avon's works of literature, providing various reasons why he should have resorted to a pseudonym. Lord Oxford was very musical, wrote poetry and comedies, and had visited all of the countries that feature in Shakespeare's plays. He held master's degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge, spoke many European languages, and knew Latin and Greek. Other candidates for the real Shakespeare range from Francis Bacon, a great scholar and philosopher, but one who unfortunately did not have the literary style found in the poetry and drama of Shakespeare, to the playwright Christopher Marlowe, who was murdered. The academic supporters and laymen who support De Vere's authorship are called Oxfordians. Those in favour of Bacon are known as Baconians, and the Marlowe aficionados are labelled Marlovians. Those who still believe in the traditional attribution are branded Stratfordians, and they're all at each other's throat. The latter cannot explain why there is no paper trail, no books or letters by way of legacy, and why Shakespeare's death attracted no attention at court or among fellow playwrights and poets. Baconians try to juggle with symbolism derived from numerology, Rosicrucianism and even Freemasonry to somehow cover up the fact that their hero wrote in a markedly different style and used a different vocabulary. As a prolific scientist, philosopher, courtier, diplomat, essayist, historian and successful politician who served as Solicitor General 1607, Attorney General 1613 and Lord Chancellor 1618, when on earth would Sir Francis Bacon have found the time to imagine, conceive and write the complete works of Shakespeare? My own discovery is more straightforward and verifiable, as you may find out for yourselves. Sonnet 76 Why is my verse so barren of new pride, so far from variation or quick change? Why with the time do I not glance aside to new-found methods and to compounds strange? Why write I still all one ever the same and keep invention in a noted weed that every word doth almost tell my name, shewing their birth and where they did proceed. 
Oh no, sweet love, I always write of you, and you and love are still my argument. So all my best is dressing old words new, spending again what's already spent. For as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love still telling what is told. In Shakespeare's Sonnet 76, the central poem in a 100 sonnet sequence within the 154 sonnets, and exactly halfway through the complete series of 152 sonnets if we disregard the Cupid-inspired last two, the poet reveals himself in the middle of the poem, as discovered by Dr. James Ferris. My name, L.O.E. de Vere, where L.O.E. stands for Lord Oxford Edward, as used in a signature. But I discovered there's more evidence than just the name. If one reads the grill of 14 by 32 from bottom to top and vice versa, and right to left as well as diagonally, the following English text emerges. All is lit. I wot the idle goer that Leo drew wet the wog in the fog as tit for tat. A wit living in a sty, drinking red tea on tap from a toy tin to rot. I bet Leo's idea woe the foe port down, a ton in a row o'er Ted, no hell to the seven gelded rats died at sea not seen. In present day English, this might be phrased and illustrated as everything is illuminated or clear. I know the idle chasing go-getter or career woman who married the Italian Earl, Edward de Vere's nickname thanks to his imported fashions and perfumes from Italy. In London, by way of revenge, an intellectual living in dire straits, earning no tin mine revenue but only continuous pocket money from the red-headed tea or Tudor Queen Elizabeth I, only a fifth of what he required. I can assure you that Leo's notions harmed the enemy port of Amsterdam. Lord Oxford was a military commander in Holland. The thousand pounds awarded in a libel case against Edward de Vere, Lord Oxford's annual stipend, the seven castrated sailors or traitors thrown into the channel by pirates were never seen again. De Vere himself had been kidnapped by Dutch and Spanish pirates in 1567 and 1585, as dramatised in Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. As Claire Asquith observed, late 16th century England was a country that provided a ready audience for dissident code. Its people were addicted to hidden meanings. Codes, devices and punning allusions or wordplay were everywhere, in street songs and ballads, conversations, poems, plays, woodcuts, portraits, jewellery, costumes. Entire buildings were constructed in the form of riddles. Readers delighted in decoding. If a decoded sequence in the dedication to Shakespeare's, notice the odd hyphen in a surname that's not double-barreled, sonnets is found by David Moffat based on the 624 sequence in the mysterious layout and in Edward de Vere's name itself. Indeed reveals the phrase, these all by E. Ver fair being the ancient French spelling of that illustrious aristocratic family name, poet, adventurer, then surely the biographical background story hidden in Sonnet 76 can be no coincidence, but must be interpreted as part of a deliberately devised and inserted pattern. In for a penny, in for a pound. If one accepts that the decrypted combinations inside the grid reveal that every word doth almost tell my name, one also ought to take into consideration the conspicuous blanks in the shape of two large adjacent T's containing no telling letters whatsoever except for AID, aid, at the top serving as a playful echo of the title page inscription for TT. Could they be referring to Edward de Vere's status as a tu true Tudor, either as Queen Elizabeth I's loyal supporter, corresponding with his Latin canting motto, Vero nihil verius, nothing more true than truth, and her own motto, Semper eadem, ever the same, as appears in line 5, and with Jesus Christ's own revelation, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6, or even as her direct descendant. 
The latter option, known as the Prince Tudor Part II theory, is supported by a living descendant and extraordinary lookalike of Edward de Vere named Charles Beauclair in Shakespeare's Lost Kingdom, The True History of Shakespeare and Elizabeth, 2010, implying a shocking incestuous scenario featuring Edward de Vere as both the illegitimate son of Elizabeth, known as the Virgin Queen, and not only her later lover, but also the father of their son, Henry Rotsley, in his day pronounced as Raisley, the third Earl of Southampton, supposedly the fair youth in the sonnets, whose motto, all for one, one for all, is alluded to in all one in line five, and destined to be King Henry the Ninth. These historico-literary aspects have been convincingly laid bare by the meticulous researcher Hank Whitmore in his The Monument, 2005, and 100 Reasons Shakespeare was Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. But at the other end of the spectrum, the American amateur historian Paul Streitz raises our eyebrows even higher by expecting us to believe that Edward de Vere was the love child of Thomas Seymour and the underage Elizabeth cheerfully neglecting Seymour's imprisonment on the 18th of January and execution on the 20th of March 1549, making it humanly impossible, even for this <coughs> notorious flirt and derriere slapper, to have sired a son born on the 12th of April 1550, coming of age in 1571. The only verifiable fact in Mr. Streitz's extravaganza seems to be his identification of Gloriana as a human female. More plausibly, the double T identifies the author of the sonnet as a devout Christian, brought up in the Protestant Reformed faith, though later suspected of Catholic leanings, for the Tau, being the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, prophesied the last day, and this was adopted by the early Christians, because its form, also the 19th letter of the ancient Greek alphabet, reminded them of the crucifixion, and so it's worn as a wooden crucifix by Franciscan friars and their patron saint, Francis of Assisi, who signed and sealed his letters and blessings with it. Having shed some light on the plethora of encrypted messages in Sonnet 76, I would not in the least be taken aback by Stratfordian clamour, accusing me of taking pure coincidence for granted. But when a sonnet is crammed with references like these, I would submit that pure chance is based on incidental occurrences instead of systematic patterns. You decide for yourselves. After all, what's in a name? To celebrate my 25th anniversary as an English lecturer, teacher trainer, translator, editor, proofreader and alternative TOEFL pioneer on the Indonesian island of Java, I'd like to sing a ballad version of Sonnet 76 based on the Indonesian evergreen Jangan ditanya kemana aku pergi Oh, no, sweet love, I always 
right of you And you in love are still my argument So my best is dressing old words new Spending again what is already spent For as the sun's daily, you would know, so is my love still telling what is told. For as the sun is daily, you would know, so is my love still telling. What is to